All right, here we are. It is Monday, October 15th, Metal Monday. How are you guys? Great guest today. Of course, my life is comedy and rock and roll, but I tend to talk a lot of rock and roll on here and music because, you know, when I started, I thought, well, Marin was talking to comedians and that's uh, he's got that covered. And of course, he kills it doing that. So what am I going to do? And I, I dove deep down into the music rabbit hole. But of course, 90 percent or not 90, but, you know, most of my life is comedy now. And of course, it's rock and roll, but I mean, it's, it's comedy every day. I go on stage, I go on stage, I go on stage, I get on a plane, I book a flight, I book a gig, whatever. You get the idea. It's the same thing over and over. And uh, I absolutely love it. And I do love talking comedy. I talk comedy all the time with friends at the clubs and uh, at lunch, dinner, 24-7 if I'm not talking music, I'm talking comedy. My point is, I love comedy. Of course I do. When I started, I started at the comedy store in Los Angeles. It was the uh, complete dream to become a paid regular at the store. And I slugged it out and I uh, worked my ass off and, and it became a reality. And after that, I was like, okay... Next goal in life, be a paid regular at the Comedy Cellar in New York. How am I going to do that? I'm not even in New York. I'm not even there. How am I going to do it? How do you do it? I don't know anybody there. What, what is the process? I don't know. Let's figure it out. And for the last three years, I've been sleeping on floors, couches, and subleasing, doing whatever I can in New York to figure out the process and take it in, take it slowly, and, and uh, enjoy the ride, of course, but get, get to the goal. And it happened. It happened uh, earlier this year. And now, in my eyes, I've made it. I'm a paid regular at two of the best clubs in the world. And I'm not over here just bragging about it. I'm just saying, man... I can't believe it sometimes. I, you know, two nights ago, I was on stage at the Comedy Store, and tonight I'll be on stage at the Comedy Cellar. To me, that's doing comedy. Back and forth. Los Angeles, New York, in the best clubs ever. Just trying to figure out who you are on those stages at the highest level. The NFL of comedy, <laughs> whatever you think is high level, the, the uh, National Baseball League or the NBA or uh, not the president, of course, not the president. That's not the highest level. <laughs> anyway, anyway, you know what I'm talking about? And it was incredible to sit down with my guest today, Noam Dorman, the owner of the Comedy Cellar. And uh, the creator of so many cool things on that block, the Village Underground, the Fat Black Pussycat. And to sit down with this man and hear the history of it was an honor to have him. And I absolutely love this guy as a friend. Anyway, the cellar. Oh, my God. It's so funny to bounce from L.A. to New York and just, just have that experience um, you know, it's just incredible. And I can't thank Noam enough for doing the podcast. What a great man and a group and a great, uh, musician and, uh, and you know, rock and roller for this podcast. We go all over, man. We talk comedy rock. It's, it's pretty much the ultimate episode of everything this show's about. So, uh, get into it. Speaking of traveling. Man, I've been, uh, you know, I went to audible.com slash Delray and picked myself up the Bruce Springsteen audiobook. You guys can do this too. If you don't like to read, audiobooks is the only way to go. It's audible.com slash Delray. I got to get this right. 
The pressure is on. I got to get it right, man. These guys are really sticklers. I can't fuck up this ad. And also, I don't want to fuck it up because I, I love this company. I've been listening to this Springsteen book. It's just incredible to hear Bruce. He's like, I was out there. It was warm. It was hot. I had the guitar. I'd been playing four hours. Sweat was in my eyes. I couldn't see. <laughs> to hear Bruce, the fucking genius in your head, just telling you and describing how he wrote the songs, his upbringing, his marriages, his depression. It was just incredible. I'm on an airplane. I don't even mind the shitty seat I'm in because I've got this great audio book. Go to audible.com slash Delray or text Delray to 500-500 to get started. Every month, Audible members get one credit good for any audio book they choose. Plus two Audible originals from a changing selection that they can't get anywhere else. They also get access to audio fitness, which I'm going to start using because, you know, I'm keeping in shape. And health workouts. How cool is that? Plus, your books are yours to keep. They don't disappear. Even if you cancel, your books are there for life. And if you didn't like it, you can exchange it, no questions asked. Start your 30-day trial, and your first audio book is free. Go to audible.com slash Delray or text Delray, that's D-E-L-R-A-Y, to 500-500. Audible is A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash Delray or text Delray to 500-500 and get started right away, man. I, I love this, man. This Bruce book knocked me out. You guys are Bruce fans. I know you are. Have you listened to this Bruce book yet? Oh, my God. Just a... I mean, it must be so hard to do a, an audio book. You're in there for hours reading it. Look, I'm trying to read this ad and I'm fucking up. Imagine you're reading your book, you know, you're just in there for hours. It's so worth it, though, man, to hear your favorite person read their book. Once again, start a 30-day trial and your first audio book is free. Go to audible.com slash Delray or text Delray to 500-500. Do it right now, man. I absolutely love this. It was so good. Uh, check it out. Memberships include one free audio book a month, exclusive sales, and 30% off all regularly priced audiobooks. How good is that, man? This is a deal, actually. It's a deal, you know? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers, magazines, and newspaper publishers. Do not sleep on this. Free apps for iPhone, iPad, Android, and Windows Phone. Check it out. Once again, it is... Don't sleep on this code. Go to Audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E, audible.com slash Delray or text Delray to 500-500. I love it. Ah, uh, Anyway, whoo, man, pressure was on on that thing. God damn. I want to give a shout out to the Patreoners out there. You guys have been loving the bonus episodes. Uh, on Thursday, I'm going to be uh, launching a bonus episode, talk a little bit about Rodney Dangerfield. I don't think a lot of people talk about him in this day and age. And he, I recently watched another special of his, and it just blew my mind. Speaking of that, also, check out Joe Rogan's new special on Netflix, man. Don't sleep on that. Patreoners, brand new out there. Dominic Gonzalez, he opened up the bonus episode. Eric Wettenkamp, old friend of mine. Oh, my God. I hadn't heard from this guy since high school. He donated to the Patreon, and now we're talking. Eric Wettenkamp and I saw at least 200 rock concerts together, and I got to get him on the podcast one day just to talk old rock stories. Oh, my God. Uh, David johnston pierce thank you for donating and then here's a couple soldiers as joey diaz would call them a couple guys that up their pledges from five bucks and and upped it more 
uh, Jeremy Seifert and David Johnson Pierce, who I just mentioned, both bumped up their donations. So thank you so much. Helping big time. Speaking of helping big time, did you guys like that Gene Hoagland episode last week? That was pretty, uh, pretty epic. A lot of people love that. And on there, we talked about the uh, high on life uh, superfood. High on life superfood. Did you guys hear us talking about that? Everybody always asks me, you know, how are you getting in shape? What are you doing? And uh, I'm doing a lot of gym. I'm doing a lot of clean eating. But also, uh, I, I don't like to stay faded, you know. I don't want to be tired or anything. High on life. I tried it out. And it is pretty damn good, man. High on life superfoods.com is going to give you a discount. If you type in the code Dean Delray, you're going to get a great discount. And try this superfood. It's vegan, gluten-free. Tastes great. Super easy to use, man. You just dump it in some water or, or a blender, whatever you want to do. Loaded with omega-3s and six essential fatty acids. Uh, this shit is good, man. Uh, I definitely felt good. Gene recommended it, and uh, I've been on it. I got, a, I got a few jars here. I'm pounding it. It tastes great. High on life superfoods. You know... You got to keep yourself together, man. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm 52 and yeah, I you got to uh you got to you got to keep yourself healthy or get yourself healthy. It's hard as shit, but do it, you know. Check it out one more time. High on life superfoods. This is some good shit. Type in the code Dean Del Rey. High on life superfoods.com. Dean Del Rey is your your code. And uh hell yeah. And also, don't forget, one last sponsor, the originals themselves, Wyco Vintage. Wycovintage.com for all your vintage rock and roll t-shirts. My favorite place on the internet. I'm constantly on there. I'm on their Instagram, Wyco Vintage, W-Y-C-O. Vintage to get some old vintage rock and roll t-shirts. Maybe you're looking for that long lost lover boy shirt. You looking for some lover boy? Turn me loose. Turn me loose. I was born a man. I would be a boy. Baby, but that put that I do. I gotta do it my way. <laughs> That's how you that's how you sing songs when you don't know the lyrics. It's I would do ya all Sam Ooh yeah gotta do it my way <laughs> uh Wycovintage.com Punch in Dell Razor Get yourself a code all kinds of great sponsors this week Oh I love them I love them Thank you helping me out out there Okay, upcoming shows, Vegas, December 26th through the 30th. I will be at the Comedy Cellar Vegas at the Rio Hotel. Let's get into the episode right now. Oh, God, I love it. Here we go. Candles lit with Mr. Gnome Dorman. All right, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Fantastic guest today. Introduce yourself, my man. My name is Noam Dwarman. I'm the owner of the Comedy Cellar. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> it was just so, uh, so professional. It's like reality television. Yeah. yeah. Owner of the Comedy Cellar. Pretty, I mean, um, it, it's just so cool to have you on because this place is so electric you know and i am a type of guy that's like when you you go what's the best club in america you know and some me being in la it was the comedy store you know same in new york it's the cellar and it was like well i need to work there you know what i mean i want to be in the highest caliber of of what i'm doing Right. And, and get in there. And people say, it ain't going to happen. And when they say it ain't going to happen, that immediately gives me the fuel to make it happen. You double your effort. Exactly. Yeah. And it's uh, in the, uh, I would say the five months I've been working here, it's been mind boggling 
uh, the energy and the the vibe and everything and, and the it, talent, the talent, everything about this place is is electric and it made me really want to uh, dig into the rabbit hole of the history of it because I worship the comedy store and I love the comedy seller. The, the two of them have such a history in comedy that it's not even funny. Those two rooms are pretty much responsible for some of the biggest comedy in the world. Right. So I don't understand what year does it open? All right, so, so you know, my whole family was always involved in music and show business. So my father had a, a very, very important, famous Middle Eastern, uh, Israeli and Arabic nightclub. He was a musician. He played in the band. And it was, you can see it on YouTube. If you look up Cafe Finjon, F-E-E-N-J-O-N, and you can see the band playing where the comedy cellar is now. And that became so successful that he moved it next door to where the Cafe Wa is now. The Cafe Wa was, had been closed. Right. And that created this kind of uh, open room where the comedy cellar is. And he tried various things. He was going to try a piano bar. I remember, I remember he, he sandblasted the walls to, to expose all the brick. And then this dude, Bill Grumfest, who I'm still friends with, and he's actually a partner in, in Vegas, a small partner in Vegas, um, he came in and, and said, kind of typical thing, I'll, I'll take the drinks, I mean, I'll take the cover, you take the drinks, and I'll bring comedians here. And at that time, there was this Brazilian girl playing guitar. and she What was year are we talking? 81. 81? Yeah. So it's not even that old. No, it's not even that old. Holy smokes. And Bill came in, he started bringing com comedy, and it was successful right away. And then he stayed on, he was the house MC for like five or six years. And he discovered Jon Stewart and, you know, the people that came out. Gilbert Gottfried was at the time and a bunch of people. And then he went on to be the head writer at Mad About You and wrote for the Oscars and a lot of stuff. And now, at what age are you at that, uh, in 81? So I'm uh, uh, a freshman in college. So you're playing music, you grew up playing music, and you yeah. grew up in the neighborhood, right? Yeah, well, I, I grew up in a neighborhood, no, I, I actually never lived in this neighborhood, I, I grew up uh, in the Upper West Side. Right. And then when I hit junior high school, we moved to the suburbs. The oh, suburbs. But yeah. I was here all the time, and right. I grew up being in the neighborhood, you know, almost once a week. Now, did your dad own the Village Underground at the time, too? And no, the Village Underground and, and the Fat Black Pussycat were, sh were clubs that I started and opened uh, much oh, later. Oh, so you bought those later on? Well, they didn't exist. Like, the, the Village Underground was a storage unit for the that building. Wow. And I, I raised the money, and I dug out, we dug out part of the basement and created the Village Underground. That's incredible. Yeah, it kind of feels like it's been there forever, right? And, Absolutely. And, and the sign, even I, I, I found some old, um, old like Lower East Side movie marquee letters. Yeah. At a flea market, to, and I put it. It makes it look like it's been there since like the forties. Oh, it yeah. definitely yeah. feels yeah. like that when yeah. I always. And and then the Cafe Wall. Now David Lee Roth's uncle on that, right? Yeah. So Manny Roth, who was a friend of ours, right? You know, so he's actually the guy who, um, we got this space, the comedy seller space from. He used to have both. Like I eventually had both, he had both. And the WA closed, as I said, in 68. Yeah. And then he had just the, where the olive tree is now. And then eventually he just kind of kept losing these spaces. And at one time he and my father were gonna be partners in something, it never panned out. But we remained friends to the end. But then I, when I got out of law school, and my father wasn't into the Middle Eastern music anymore. I took the room, and I started my own band, and didn't know what to call the place. So I remembered the Cafe Wa when I was a kid. I mean, a little kid, like six, seven years old. Yeah. So I, re so I took the name again, Cafe Wa. And I even called Manny. He said, listen, Manny, I'm going to use the name. He, well, he wasn't happy about it. I said, listen, I, I looked it up with lawyers and everything like that. You know, it, it, it seems abandoned, but I'd be happy to, I'd be happy to you know, write up the history of the Wa and use your name and all that stuff. And he's like, I don't want any of that. Like he, he, so, you know, that was it. So I took the name Cafe Wa. It was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made because now the Cafe Wa is very, very famous again. Yeah. And people now associate it with Manny Roth. Absolutely. But it had nothing to do with him. That's like hilarious. It, it, yeah, it had nothing to do with him. The, they the, just wipe your uh, Yeah, your, I'm, your like, I'm like Soviet. I'm like out of the whole picture because I sold it. <laughs> but the, the, the Cafe Wa's I had, we had a house band that became very, very famous all over the world. You know, lines around the block to come in. And that was all my thing. But then I began to lose my hearing, and I, and I couldn't do it anymore. 
were you uh, the owner when Van Halen gets back together and plays no, there? No, that was like like two years after I sold it. Wow. But Manny came for that. He did? Yeah. Yeah. And he came in to hang out with me. I mean, it's, it's strange. And, you know, of course, his name is Manny and my father's name was Manny. So that confuses people, too. So people think that my father was the guy who used to own the WAV and all stuff like that. Once the comedy seller gets up and, and rolling, yeah. um, I think one of the biggest mysteries, and same with the comedy store, and what I love about the two rooms, is the mystique. Nobody quite knows how you, how do you get past? How do you start working there? What is, what is the process, you know? And, and that was always the, the questions at the comedy store starting out. And, um, and same here. How was the eventually um, the the thing put in place? You know what I mean? Like the way to start booking it. How do you get people in here? All that kind of stuff. So Bill, the guy who who started it, he was already a, kind of a working comic, and I think he'd been roommates with Paul Reiser and at Penn. Anyway, um, he. At that time, comedy was very hot. That's like the first comedy boom. 80s, he, the first boom. Yeah, yeah. He, he put ads in the Village Voice and immediately started selling out on weekends. Weekdays were all very slow, very dicey. Um, and he would, he would do the booking. And then when he left, there was someone else who did an interim, and then Esty, Esty was a hostess. And then Esty took it over. And yeah, there's all this, there's all, excuse me, my nose is itching. There's, there's all this kind of like uh, mystique about it, but it's all, it, it's all legend. There's, there's never been anything that complicated about it. If we could get wind of somebody who was funny, however we were able to get wind of them, whether they were recommended or, I mean, in those days it was harder to, to audition because you couldn't send a YouTube clip and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Even, even to have, a recording of yourself on, on video in yeah. 1981 was kind of, uh, you know, an obstacle. So, but we were never like snobbish or anything at all. You know? Yeah. Pe pe now, people who didn't get in would often, I think, create their own rationalizations of why they didn't get in. Oh, they don't want this type. They don't want that type. You have, they, want, they want people with more credits, you know, but these were all yeah. people just telling themselves stuff. In the end, anybody who could walk in and if the audience, if they killed, they would get booked. Period. Hard work, you know? Yeah. It's a hard work, and a lot of people don't want to do the hard work, and then they start making excuses instead of, oh, it's really me. They just start making up stuff, and then it just you know, goes on as a, you know urban legend. Where, where I think we were always different. I'm different. I know my father was this way. Um, then what I hear about the store is that we never felt that we should start giving comedians advice. Like, like in that Gary Shandling documentary, the story about how, I think it's Mitzi Short told uh, Gary Shandling, you know, you're a writer, you're not a performer. Right, right, right. Like, that kind of thing is just nuts to me. Yeah. You know, we never did any, we've always never done that kind of stuff. I think that everybody has their own way. You know, I think she was more of motherly, yeah. where it would be like, you know, since she was in the business so much that she would just kind of be like, maybe this is better for you or whatever, you know. But there uh, are these stories also from the, you know, um, uh, this would happen at the, at the comic strip too with, with Lucian, where um, people who later became famous, they remember these dumb comments that the comedy club owner said to them when they were, you know, like kind of like arrogant yeah. advice, and they never forgive it. Like oh, they yeah. never fucking forgive it. Like, you asked Daryl Hammond. You ever have Daryl Hammond on your show? No. Ask him about it. I think it was Lucian, you know, told him, like, yeah. something negative. He, that's it. Like, so. I, know, I know that some people have told me stuff. And when you're young in comedy, not, not in life, but in comedy or music, let's say, you're like, yeah, that guy doesn't know what he's fucking talking about. And I do think later on in life, I'm like, oh, that guy was right on the money. Maybe kind of wacky the way that the, the delivery was, or maybe brutal, but sometimes you're like, oh yeah, I was that or this or what, you know? Maybe not always, but sometimes. Well, I, I don't think you need to be that much of an expert to judge most things. Like if I asked you, how was Avengers, you know, Infinity Wars, and you told me it was awesome, I wouldn't say, well, you know, he said it was awesome, but what does he know? You know, he, he's not a movie director. <laughs> I would say, oh, he's probably... So, same thing with comedy. Like, well, like you don't need to be any ex special insight into comedy to say somebody killed, they didn't kill, somebody's funny, they're not yeah. funny. Even to identify a hack, 
like any waitress who works in the comedy cellar, they're very like you. If you ask them who's funny, and who's not, you can you can take that to the bank. Yeah, I mean they know. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. matter of fact, a couple of nights ago, uh, one of the guys came up to me and he said, "Hey, I'd never seen you, and uh, you were great, man." And I said. That means more than any of those fucking people laughing tonight. Absolutely. 100% because you see it all day, all night. Yeah. And for him to say that, I was like, oh, man, okay, cool. You know, because that's what you want. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Everybody yeah. knows that. And because and, they're jaded, you know. Yeah. And, and, and what they will, what, what the advantage they do have over like a... I guess like a typical road audience is that they are able to see when somebody's not original and they they will discount their opinion when they feel like some they've heard this kind of thing before or whatever it is. Yeah. So that's what the waitresses have. So, you know, and I guess that's why hacks probably thrive more on the road. In, in, on the road, yeah. Right. Yeah. Generally more sophisticated in New York. So you guys are up and running from 81 and of course uh, like the comedy store, do you feel those gloomy days of like the mid nineties where oh, it gets, yeah. yeah. So when does it really, after the first wave, does it get really dead again? And do you ever think about like, let's try something else like music or something or what happens? No, we never tried it. Uh, we never thought about trying anything else, but it did get slow. We were struggling. We did go into debt at, for, for the longest time. The wah was the main engine of our, you know, of income here. Um, and then towards the end of my father's life in the late 90s, kind of when a Tough Crowd started and all that stuff, uh, and Seinfeld, I think that was, that, was a, that was a major event when Seinfeld did that comedian documentary. Oh, yeah, comedian. Yeah, that was great. We were really the focal point of that documentary. And business began to get better. But even then, still, it wasn't anything like it is now. Right. And then it just kept getting better and better and better and better and better. And I think that we really benefited from the age of social media and all that stuff because um, uh, the, as knowledge got better in terms of customers knowing uh, what the best places were to go, uh, that was our best friend because we were always the best place. Right. But the average tourist, they didn't know. They were, you know, go to Gotham or whatever. They had no Yeah, like when you Google and the yeah, first club yeah. comes up yeah. and you're like, here it is. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you, and in so many, like in those days, like with City Search and or even before that, the voice, you place ads and you'd, you'd cherry pick some review. From, and nobody knew what to make of it. But people are very, very sophisticated now. And like people all over the world listen to every podcast that comes out of here and they hear all the comedians talking. And so they really know, and, and that, that really, I think, a lot of things helped. A yeah. A lot of things helped. What I really like about you, and uh, I don't know, how old are you? I'm 55. 55, I'm 52. So I really relate with you, like, in a lot of ways. What I like about you is you understand social media, you understand podcasting, and you're, you're always here, and you, you understand, you know, you're not like... You're not 55 like we know 55-year-olds. You know what I mean? Well, you know, it's funny. I, just, I was just telling somebody that because we, I was, we were always struggling in so many ways, that caused me and my father to learn a lot of skills like PHP, MySQL coding, networking, recording engineering, sound engineering, like all kinds of stuff that... Because to get it done right was just cost prohibitive for, for the longest time. So, in the end, I came away like I know all about all these things. You know, I can I can do my own website. I can do my own database database programming. And now that I have kids and I'm more successful, and I've stopped doing a lot of that stuff, I'm worried I'm going to get old. Yeah. Like exactly what you're saying. Like oh shit. Like because I used to like. I mean, if you looked at my bookshelves, it's like, you know, Microsoft Access for Dummies, Visual Basic for Dummies, .NET for Dummies, like, like yeah. every, every single high-tech thing, you know. Yep. Just books and books of computer books and music books and recording books and Pro Tools, and like everything. Uh, uh, Yamaha Sound Reinforcement uh, Manual, you know, like yeah. all these things. Because I, I felt I needed to know these things myself. And I, so I'm trying to stay with it now, but it's harder. Yeah, because uh, like Bobby Kelly and I were talking to you and Bobby was like, I said, man, I really love the sound on stage, uh, you know, when I'm on. That's a, such a key thing. 
And, and then Bobby's like, oh, yeah, the Village Underground, it, it wasn't right at first. And then Noam was like, oh, I got I to gotta fix this. I can tell it's not right. And you kept tweaking and tweaking until it was great. Those kind of things a lot of people don't understand. And also you playing music, and I played music all my life. You know right away, audio, you know, right. is the most key thing besides uh, visual of uh, comedy, you know? And, and the thing is that if you hire the typical sound guy that's available to go, they don't know either. They'll they, talk to the owner like they do know, but they don't know. And actually they can be quite arrogant because, as you know, the sound men... At, at some point, they say, "Ah, oh, musicians always complain." Oh, community, and and they begin to just, like disregard yeah. that stuff, you know. And I've come down very hard on some sound men for that at times. But yeah, you're right. I've been on, on stage enough, so I can go on stage and listen to it. I say, "No, it's good." And I think we talked about this. And it can't be too loud either, because then the comedians don't project. It's got to be just right. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. At what point do you realize that that downstairs cellar room was pretty magical? Um, meaning when you're in a room, I've done, you know, hundreds of rooms immediately you go like, ah, this is, this is a room, man. Well, that's funny because I always thought, like, I remember being young when we were first seller and I would go around to the other rooms and there were good rooms at the time, especially Catch a Rising Star was a really good room. And then I would go to Florida and it was like, I think it was an improv in Fort Lauderdale and I would, I would just go to rooms all over. And I remember always telling my father, you know, I know, but I think the comedy cellar is really like there's something, it's just a, there's a, a warmth here that I think makes it better. But having said that, the comedians didn't come around to thinking the comedy cellar was such a great room at first because they would complain about people walking in to go to the bathroom. Oh, yeah. And they would complain about having to work to the, to the, to the wings, right. to the left yeah. right as opposed to. So it took them a while, but the. The thing is that the room is, at this point now, is always packed. And there's nothing that beats a packed room. Nothing. And that's just it. So, so I, yeah, I, th I think the room really became indisputably magical when it, was always, when it became always packed. This is how much it was to me, was I've been two years in doing comedy, and I was doing Caroline's, and after my first set, I immediately cabbed it over just to come look at the place. To, to like, see that open, that's at one hundred percent. I was like, "There it is." I was just kind of sitting out front. I remember specifically, Steve was out there. He goes, Can "I help you," and I was like, "Ah, uh, I'm a comic." <laughs> He's like, "Yeah," you know. And, <laughs> and I was like, "Ah, oh, yeah," you know. I was just kind of looking at the sign, and I took a picture, and I was like, "All right, I'm out of here." And it was just, uh, you know, I had to come feel it. And it know? was gritty, you know. And and you know, we, you know, we have a comedy. I'm not plugging it, but we have a Comedy Central show coming out in in October or November. And one of the frictions I've had in getting that made is to fight against the urge to make things slick. What is the show for Comedy Central? It's a, it's a clip show like we're going to shoot all week long and by the end of the week, getting ready to air what I believe will be Friday nights will be the, uh, a half an hour of the comedians talking about and doing jokes about whatever's going on in the politics and pop culture, with, you know, kind of the week. I think yeah. it's called This Week at the Comedy Cellar, so... And are you going to shoot it at the back table there? Or? Yeah, we're going to shoot at the table. And, and I'm so hoping basically like the podcast, kind of. Yeah, and then, and then at the Village Underground and here. I'm, ho I'm hoping to shoot in Vegas, too. Right. And Yeah, the, 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 we did a pilot. I thought the pilot was okay. They, they seemed to really like it. The, the worst part of the pilot was the, the table scenes, but I think they can be much better. Right. So, so now... Recently, while I've been here, there's been two specials already shot here, Ray Romano, Ray Romano. and Bumpin' Mikes. They both yeah. come out in November, yeah. which is, and I was uh, here for the Ray Romano one, which was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, so are those the only two specials that have been shot here so far? Um, Robert Kelly did his at the Underground. Oh, wow. Uh, Ted Alexandro did one. I think that's coming out with, uh, through Bill Burr's organization. Oh, yeah. oh wow. Yeah, All Things Comedy. That's yeah. what I'm on. Uh, so, so I think Ted's, Ted, Ted's come out, and I think um, Nick Griffin shot something there. I don't, I don't know where that's been out, but uh, the, the the Ray Romano one will be the and and the the Raw Sattel one. I think those will both get a lot more attention than the yeah, previous those, ones. Those are going to be great. Yeah, man. those are big big ones. Let's get a little bit into you, and then we'll talk about Vegas. So you're growing up in New York City, and you love music like I do. Uh, growing up, what is the uh, 
gateway band that gets you into it. I always ask people, usually it's either Zeppelin or Kiss, but if you're older, it could be like, you know, I had a guy on yesterday and it was uh, Hendrix, you know? What you're no, in? New- it, was, it was the Beatles. It, it was, was the Beatles. Was totally the Beatles. Yeah. 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 So you're you're at home. You see it on Ed Sullivan. No, I'm not that old. All right. <laughs> I don't know what. I can't remember what year that is. What is that year? Is it Ed Sullivan? Must be like '64 or something. Oh, gotcha. Got so, I mean, I could have seen it, but I, yeah, I, I don't yeah. Remember. No. So so for, first of all, I grew up in a. My father was a was a professional musician at the time. That was his main thing. Right. So I was I was immersed in. Um, like uh, Middle Eastern and Arabic music and stuff like that. And then my father was also, he loved music from the 40s and stuff from when he was a kid, you know. Uh, so, but rock and roll, like, you know, Dylan used to come into my father's coffee house all the time. My father knew Dylan. Wow. And, and he, he never rated Dylan. Like, he, he, as a matter of fact, when, Dil, when a really good song would come on the radio that, and I'd say, well, you know, he told me, tell me Dylan wrote that. He's like, I, I just can't believe it. I don't, I don't believe he wrote that. <laughs> like, he, he couldn't accept that Dylan. Really? Yeah, because he, he just saw Dylan as this kind of like, you know, mediocre guitar player hacking out chords with their yeah, whole, jangly coffee shop guy. Yeah, yeah, and playing like, like the most rudimentary harmonica, you know. And my yeah. father wasn't a big lyrics guy. He, he, he didn't get Dylan. Yeah. So rock and roll was not. And I can remember actually as a little kid when the Beatles cartoon was on. Oh yeah. And it's before I was playing music. When the songs would come on, I would actually turn it down because I, I wouldn't get in trouble or anything. But for some reason, I knew my father would just like, what, the, what, what, what what's that rock and roll? Yeah. <laughs> but then later, I started taking classical guitar, I guess, in um, the third grade, I started playing. You just and, got an acoustic with the nylon strings? Yeah, yeah. And then, actually, I think one of my first guitars is hanging in the other room there. Wow. It's all beat up. So, uh, and then... And I don't, you know, and I'd heard the Beatles, of course, because everybody listened to the Beatles. But I didn't know any Beatles records or anything. But then, by like fifth grade, it was pretty late to it, when the Beatles had already broken up, that's when my friend Brett Fields played me Meet the Beatles, I think it was, with right. I Want to Hold Your Hand. Or, or no, it wasn't that. It was Beatles. It was, they had the red album and the blue album, this kind of oh, compilation yeah, yeah, yeah. albums. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. With the dates. Yeah, and he yeah. played me the, the those compilation albums. Yeah. And it, and I, I blew my mind, you know, and, and I just became totally immersed in the Beatles. Not a Stones guy then. Yeah, I'm a Stones guy, but but that it's, wasn't my gateway. It's funny, whenever, whenever people are like first into Beatles, they're not a Stones, it seems, as much. No, and he actually had that. That's great. A Stone's greatest hits album too. It was like Through the Past Darkly. It was shaped oh, yeah. like an octagon. Yeah, or, yeah. You know that yeah, one. Yeah, that right? one. The he- stop sign one. Yeah, the stop, hexagon. Yeah, and and that had uh, uh, she's a rainbow and some some r- really cool yeah, stuff. The on weird it. shit on it. Yeah, octagon. So yeah, I was into the Stones too. And then I shortly after that, I got in. I, I, Let it bleed was my favorite Stones album for oh, a long time. You know? So great. Yeah. Do you start to go to concerts? Yeah, well, you know, I, I went to a lot of concerts because my best friend's father was the cover editor of Newsweek magazine at the time. Now, Newsweek magazine, this is during the Watergate era or shortly after. 70s. Yeah, nor, and Water, uh, Newsweek magazine was a very important magazine then, and he was nominated for Pulitzer Prize. So anyway, any major event this dude had tickets for. Wow. And he would always take m- his son and me. So we saw... Elton John and this yeah, Led Zeppelin and all kinds of concerts. You saw Zeppelin? Yeah, but I didn't get to see the Stones then at that time because um, and uh, I was punished. And something was school, and my father never followed through on his punishments, ever. Yeah. But for whatever reason, this time he's like, no, you can't go to that concert. This is like 1970, whatever, four or five. Ooh. And, oh. I, and I said to him, but Dad, you don't understand. Yeah. This is probably the last time they will ever tour. <laughs> That's, I fell for that one in 81 on the Tattoo You Tour. Because that was really what yeah. everybody saw. Oh, it, it, it like the, the Beatles are already long yeah. done. And yeah, and it kind of seemed real. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, Keith's strung out on heroin. Yeah. He's going to die any day, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Zeppelin, what year you see them in the 70s? It was around the song remains the same time. Ooh, 70, uh, 73. But, the, yeah, maybe, yeah, I guess maybe it could have been 73, but the best concert I saw yeah. was Elton John. I guess it was right between the Caribou album and, and Goodbye um, Yellow Brick Road. And Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Wow. I, that, that was intense. Like, that, at I, the I, Garden? At the Garden, yeah. Wow. And I saw Paul McCartney 
that same time. And wings? With Wings. That was a tour that they made, that triple album. Live oh, yeah. Album. Yeah, yeah. And he was still Paul McCartney then. I mean, he was still like, uh, yeah. made, but yeah. still the Elton John one was better in every way. Better than Zeppelin, huh? Yeah, it, I've never, yeah, it, it was just, maybe, you know, for who I was at, at the age yeah. I was, yeah. Yeah. And so then you start playing, you start getting a band going and stuff. Is it a rock band or what was it? Yeah, it was like a rock band playing mostly like, well, I was also into a lot of that, um, AM, AM single kind of radio that oh, was yeah. going out like Beach Baby and Seasons in the Sun and uh, you know Little Willie I, I liked all that stuff but the interesting thing is at that time that also included like the Jackson 5 oh I loved it and how about like Strawberry Letter 22 yeah it, oh. uh, uh, Brothers Johnson but and so it, it was it was a big genre and like I can remember people who belittled that kind of music would belittle the Jackson 5 in those days. Yeah. And later they would belittle the Bee Gees because, you know, the, the people don't get it. But I worship the Bee Gees. Yeah. They're, they're, well, I mean, nobody says a bad word about them now, right? But at the time, because yeah. disco was considered kind of cheesy. I thought Saturday Night Fever, to me, my love for New York City 100% is Taxi Driver, Saturday Night Fever, Godfather, you know, those are the New York to me. The pre-Giuliani, yeah. the dirty, weird city, and now the Comedy Cellar. Of course, those are my, my things of New York City. Like, I, I'm here, well, I've been here four months. I only go to here, you know, like, like this is it for me, you know what I mean? Well, well New, York, New York is way better now than it's ever been, right? but, it, but it's not as rich as it used to yeah. be, you know, it's, it's a lot more. And I also think of CBGB's as New York, yeah, the CBGB's Ramones. Yeah, was an awesome place. Did you ever go there? I went there, but I, I didn't go there in the, during like the, when Blondie was playing there or something right. like that. I went there later on when some friends were doing gigs there. Yeah. Yeah, because they were a lot like the cellar where yeah. they were open. Uh, everybody goes, I can't believe they closed, but they would be a ghost town for weeks on end unless some big band was playing. During the weeknights, it was just empty. Yeah. You know, people never ever remember that kind of stuff, you know? And, and, and my experience with CBGBs, although was not extensive experience that it wasn't curated very much like anybody could get a gig there yeah yeah and, totally and, yeah. yeah it wasn't like uh you know it was just a, a a working room where bands came in sometimes they have like five bands in a night you yeah. know but it was a magic it did have oh yeah this vibe you know you, you go if you want anybody went in there once they remembered being in cbgb's you know and that's magic you know sometimes a, a lot of owners uh us included, you you back into that. It's not like you have this. You're great genius, and you can draw this out like a, at a storyboard before you create it. It just oh, there's a lot of luck or or trial and error. It's not it's not luck so much as trial and error. Trying right. this, trying that, changing this, move the lights here, move the lights there. Yeah, you know, and and then all of a sudden, ah, that's it. Don't fucking touch it now. Yeah, you know, leave it. <laughs> and leaving it is leaving it is is, uh, is heady too because you know it's tempting. People tell you, no, you need to update. Blah, blah, blah. No, leave it. It's perfect the way it is. Yeah. That's what I love about the comedy store. Everybody got these big neon signs or these or these uh, picture signs and everything. And it's still the guy at the end of the night, the yeah. door guy on the ladder, putting the names up, yeah. keeping that old school marquee. They'd be nuts to change it. They'd be nuts to change nuts it. Nuts to change it, yeah. When you... When you start to play music, do you start to have some success, or like uh, you and your band? Well, no. So, so okay. In <laughs> high school, I never played in any serious band. Then I went to college, and I, well, this, you know, outside Steve, you know, the Louis guy. Yeah, yeah. So his older brother was my roommate in college. That's how we met. Oh yeah. Yeah, and he's a very good musician. So he loved all these same like dumb singles from the 70s and whatever it is and he loved Elton. so we had like a little simon and garfunkelish duo he played piano or guitar and and we were pretty good and then two stories so then we we took a semester abroad we, we played in israel and we got a steady gig at a nightclub in israel well we became pretty successful and he even well, offered to let us stay and work there but he turned it down and that was kind of my idea for the wah was that was that summer that that semester in israel gave me the idea for for the wah but there's, so we came back 
to college, and it was a, a Tufts, and there was a campus talent competition. And we played I Want You Back, the Jackson 5. We had like an acoustic version, of, and, and the song Brandy. You know, there's a, oh, yeah. uh, there's a port on a Western Bay. We had like a, a and, and we were great. I mean, we, we destroyed. We, we had this in the bag. There's only one more act, and, and we've got this. Yeah. And the last act is Tracy Chapman. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Keith say, Robinson and I just heard Tracy yesterday in a steakhouse, and we're like, look how good that is. Oh, my God. And, and, and she is like silent and shy. Yeah. And, you know, not a peep out of her. It just gets up there, and she goes, sorry is all that you can and, and, and we just saw it just all <laughs> just unravel. <laughs> we're done. Unravel. She was so much better than us. Wow. And she was, and I've compared her to Chappelle in a way. She was the full Tracy Chapman. Like she was a year younger. Just than had it. Yeah, there was no development. Yeah. There was no like, no, there no 10,000 hours, none of that shit. Yeah. And, she, and most of those songs... She or he she had already written. Wow. So and I used to play with her at college from time to time. I don't know if she remembers me or not, but yeah. we, we used to play sometimes. So that's my kind of a brush. And then, you know, it is it, you know, um Brian Koppelman, who is the creator of Billions. Yeah, yeah. Discovered I met him Tracy. Through you, yeah. yeah, he discovered Tracy Chapman. He was a year younger than me, I guess, too, or two years younger than me. So Oh yeah, he was like an A and R guy, right? He was his his dad was his dad, Charles Copeland, yeah, was an important right. guy in the in the industry. Yeah, so it's all these kind of little things. And, and now his son is I'm actually I I really good friends with his son, but it's neither here nor there. That's wild. Yeah, when you're doing Cafe Wa, um, like I, I think Prince played. What did he play the underground? He did the underground. He's come a lot to the underground. Wow, and and and. Were you were you like talking to him and stuff? Like no, he was he's full too weird i mean yeah he was just come in and do the shows and 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 what were they like secret shows like because he he would do those like in san fran i went to a few of them just secret shows no he didn't do shows in the underground oh god he'd just come in he became very enamored with this group of musicians that was working there at the time and he would come down to watch them all and he did get up on stage one time and play for a while and um uh larry graham Oh, awesome. Play. There's some, there's some clips on using Larry Graham playing at the underground. But Prince would come in, and it was, you know, and we're used to dealing with big stars. Yeah. Now, of course, I guess Prince is a bigger star. But, I mean, he, he had to have somebody watch the food being made. It had to be brought out in, in saran wrap. Nobody could look at him. It, 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 was, it was just, it was like a whole, it's like they brought a writer. Right. right? And, and it was intense. And... You know, I, but I've never seen electricity like like just his presence in the room. Yeah, just like it just supercharged the atmosphere. It's pretty amazing, yeah. right? Yeah, never seen anybody like that. Well, especially there was a long period of time where he didn't go out, so it was like kind of like when Chappelle disappeared for a while and went to Africa and everything. And people are like, wow, is he a well, Prince after that big battle with the record company and everything? You just never saw him, but he would, there would be these things of like, Hey, Prince is here. You're like Prince. And that happened the night I met him, you know, like when this is so funny because uh, Jacob Dylan tells a story that when we met him, the guy came over and said, Prince would like you guys to join, join him at the table. He Prince, it would never go out that it was so rare that he was out that we thought it was Prince William. That's, <laughs> that, that's how, that's how rare it is. We thought it would be Prince, an actual Prince over Prince. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. And, and then you wonder, was it an act? Was it real? What the fuck? You know, it's yeah. Mystique is a, is a, one of the most powerful things to have. Uh, in business or as a performer or everything, and it's really lost, bec unfortunately, because of social media. But social media is great for other things. But you do not have any more mystique in the industry at all anymore, no. except for a Dave Chappelle or whatever, with no um, no social media. And just, boom, he pops into town. He goes, "I'm doing this room, and it sells out in an hour." Yeah, but Chappelle walks in without a posse or bodyguard. Yeah, totally, he walks around totally, and. And he's a big star. He's a big star. John Mayer. John Mayer. Uh, John Mayer is a big star, and and and, and at the very height, like like when he was like a like the, you know going out with Jessica Simpson, all that stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. He's still walking by himself, and and 
people would buzz about it. Yeah. But he didn't, you know, try to impose any kind of big, like, mystique about himself. He was very, he was down to earth. At what point do you decide, let's do the Village Underground and the Fat Black Pussycat as two more clubs? Is it because, obviously, the seller only holds, what's the seller hold? Like 115. 115, so you're going to be sold out all three, four shows on the weekend. You, you, you're like, wait, we need to get some more people in here and and so you decide to turn at first is it just the village and then the pussycat yeah, first or? just the village underground and, so, and it was gradual first we were still doing music there and then we then we gave up saturday night then we gave up friday night and finally uh i i had just i just lost my i mean i'd been playing like four or five nights a week for 20 something years and i and i just i, I had a, i had i had a um my first child was born and I, maybe even the second one was on the way, and I realized this was not compatible a compatible lifestyle with the dad that I. So that you I were playing in the village every yeah, night. I was playing most nights. Yeah. Holy shit! So it was like, and and what was it like a house band, and people would just come in and see a yeah, house like, band, like a house band. This was like what this is what Prince used to come see. You come, well, he, John Mayer used to come to see our band a lot. Prince would come to see the the funk band that would play on Mondays, but um, like. Colin and Nick, the guys that you know that I sometimes play yeah, with. And yeah, yeah. A lot of these guys uh, would play with the band. Um, Sasha Allen, who now tours with the Stones, was in the band. Yep. Amanda Brown, who's now Adele's main lead singer, was in the band. Um, it, it, it was quite a good band, but it, ju it just burned me out. And, you know, and, and drinking becomes part of that routine. Of course. I know that gig. Yeah. and It's like two, three a night, but it's seven nights a week. Or more, or, or more, or, or, and 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 the thing is, I was like at home, or I didn't have liquor in my house. I'm, I'm going on vacation; I don't drink. But I was falling into that habit, and then driving home, and I didn't want my kids to smell liquor on my breath. I didn't want to. I, I just said, "This is this is. I've done this, and I need to stop." So yeah. I just kind of like, "Let's just turn it to comedy." So that that was really what did it. And then it does. It starts to slowly take off because I'll tell you what, that room's damn electric right now, man. I was on in there last night and I was laughing inside, going like, "This room is insane." Yeah, I had trouble with the room at first. I had trouble with the acoustics. I had trouble with the laughs being loud enough. I had trouble. There used to be like a, a, a like a soffit that separated the upper level and the lower level. That I mean, it's it's already still a little bit of a problem that the, that it feels a little bit like two rooms sometimes. But this really created this kind of psychological, I, I thought, obstacle or barrier of, of feeling like two different rooms so that the people in the back were disengaged. So I had I spent a lot of money to get rid of that. And then we moved the stage up and it was down, made it higher, lower, bigger, smaller, like all, all kinds of things, changed the lighting. But it took, it took at least a year. And then I, then I uh, put tin on the ceilings to make them more reverberant. Really? Because so, you, like the laughs would hit it and yeah. pow. Because as you know, because it was dead. Yeah. Well, in in live, especially as opposed to acoustic music like a Carnegie Hall. Right. For rock, for loud music with drums, you don't. You want a dead room. Absolutely. You want, and but for comedy, you don't want a dead room. And the room was quite dead because it had really been tweaked for music. And so at first, I thought I could get around that just by miking the audience, and that did help. Wow. But then I said, it's not going to work. And this is kind of where the experience of like learning about sound and everything. I said, no, I, need, I need a really rigid surface on the ceiling. So that was a whole ordeal, making the ceiling into like a, a metal thing. So you put aluminum up there. Yeah, I think it's aluminum. Like, but, but whatever, it, it's hard. Right. And then immediately the last got louder. You know? Wow. And that made a big difference. That's wild. Yeah. And you know, they get louder because acoustically they're louder, and then they get louder because people laugh more when there's more laughter. So it, 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 it's of course. a double thing. Yeah, it gets, yeah. it gets contagious. Yeah. At what, at what point, how does Vegas happen? Who comes to you, and how do you decide to do that? Uh, Vegas, I don't know what I was thinking. So, so <laughs> I, I was in Vegas one time, and I. And I how many years ago? Four, four years ago? I don't know. Right. And I drove by Harris or whatever, and I saw Robert Kelly. In his big, you know, huge billboard, doing some show, and and I'm like, you know, that'd be fun to have comedy seller in Vegas. So I started, you know, sending some emails, whatever it was, and just to random casinos. Yeah, just to random casinos, and then 
Turned out a friend of a friend knew the owner of SLS Casino who introduced me to another guy. Who just, and, and, and finally, I wound up in the office at Caesars organization. And then they wanted too much money, and then they wanted too much money again, and I kept walking. And finally, like after the end of years, I get a call where they said, okay, we'd like you to do it, and, and these are the terms. And, and they convinced me to do it at the Rio, which I still don't know. That may end up actually being a, having been a good thing. I think so. And I'll get into that after you. Go ahead, tell me. What. Well, my thought was yeah. immediately uh, you come in on a whole new landscape of where the casinos start charging for parking now, right. which they had never done in the history of Las Vegas. MGM did it first, and everybody went, oh, man, that's a horrible thought. And then, uh-oh, these guys picked up millions a year from it, and all the casinos picked up on it after. Now... Uh, the only ones that don't do it are the um, the what's the South Point out there, you know, which is out there, yeah. and then the one you're in. The real. And <laughs> everybody I talked to, as I was on stage the first night at the Vegas Cellar, I said I thought I was going to do all these jokes for tourists. I said, "Hey, uh, any tourists here?" And I got two claps, yeah. and this was happening. Every show out of the 10 shows I did there. And every time I talked to people after the show, they went, oh, this is where the locals go, man. And the locals love comedy because of Netflix. And they go, we all come here. It's free parking. We don't have to go onto the strip. And it's just a great place to come. And, and it really was awesome, I thought, for that. Yeah, I, you, you've hit it because uh, I, we, we're getting this nice local crowd there. And, we, and we're getting... Uh, more and more tourists. Yeah. And once it becomes really well known among the tourists, we're going to have the best of both worlds. And it's very expensive to operate a place on the strip. It's much cheaper. Our overhead is much cheaper in the Rio. As far as rent? Yeah, rent and, you know, all the, and the percentages and, and everything. So if the place gets going... Yeah, I think I think we might be happy that we were kind of like off the beaten path, but it, it's it's been hard. It's been hard. It's been challenging to project our name into Vegas without the real estate on the strip. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But man, you know, I think that the greatness of of having the locals is with. The tourists, they're like, we'll go there for a minute, then we'll go see Beatles Love, and then we'll go to dinner or whatever. It's just a drop in, and they're not necessarily there for you know more yeah. than like the, maybe thirty minutes or something. They want to leave, they get angsty. I've done comedy in Vegas for years, and I've never ever enjoyed it. And so when I went to the cellar, I was like, the first thought I was like, oh, I would shoot a special here. It felt that good to me. I was like, this is incredible. This is great. It was well, the laughs allowed in that room. It was loud in design. that room. Yeah. And it was great, um, great sound. And just the, uh, it was real people. You know yeah. what I mean? It was these Vegas people that are uh, big comedy fans now, you know? And they're definitely looking for something to do. Yeah. Yeah, it's working out. And, and, there, and we've had good houses. Like, we ne we've never... At the slowest we've been, it hasn't been, like, dead, you know? Now, the weekend I was there was the biggest weekend at the time. Yeah. And the rooms were full all, in, and the weekend was wild. I was like, this is amazing. And we have, like, Ray Romano's dropped in, Jeff Ross has dropped in, uh, 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 Amy Schumer dropped in, yeah. uh, George Wallace dropped in. So we're getting drop-ins. It's, it's a nice, yeah, this is a nice trend there. Yeah. But having said all that, um, it's a, it's a, it's it's a lot more work than I thought it would be, and I'm not sure if I if I had known that we were about to have a Comedy Central show, which of course could run eight episodes and get canceled. But I think I might have not done Vegas, to be honest. Wow. Sometimes you're just looking around for something new to do. Yeah, I get you. But uh, I think a TV show is is a lot more interesting to do, and you can't do everything. No. Like, you know, one of the... Something's going to suffer. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I worry about with Trump that I don't, I don't hear anybody talking about is that just, whether he's guilty or innocent, presuming he's guilty, doesn't matter. To have a president, like, taken up with this kind of thing for a year or two years, 
how can he keep his mind on it? Like, you know, like yeah. I couldn't do it. Yeah. Could, could I run the comedy? I couldn't run the fucking comedy cellar if I was being investigated by the FBI and yeah. flipping all my employees or whatever. It's like, I won't be able to sleep. So I believe that. <laughs> it's no, just, okay. tw- I'm, I'm just saying though, 24 yeah. seven, you yeah. know, it's like, oh, you know. So you can focus on one, maybe two things in your life. And if you have a kid, if you have kids, you can focus on the kids and then hopefully have enough attention. To, so having Vegas and the club and the TV show, it's like, I know, I'm afraid I'm going to do all of them half-ass, so I'm worried about it. Who do you think, you've seen a lot of comedy. I don't know if you even go into the showrooms anymore. Yeah. I did see you at sure the Village Underground recently. As soon as you came in, I was like, oh, I got to do good. <laughs> yeah, you don't have I'm still, at that, that, I'm still at that thing where it's like, I must kill at all times. You know what I mean? Like somebody can walk in and go, hey, what, what was that up there? You know? <laughs> you can't but get out of here. Have you seen um, over your years, besides, let's say, Chappelle, somebody where you were just like, wow. You know, like you just couldn't believe, like say somebody newer, or you just can't believe. You how- mean before they were famous or after? They yeah, were- just before they're famous. So before they were famous, uh, you know, Natterman would accuse me of like you know just working backwards, but it's not the case. John Stewart was a juggernaut. John Stewart was fantastic. You should destroy. Wow. Um, we used to have comedians in the Wah. In the Wah, have you ever done the Wah? They still have them sometimes. But the the Wah was a difficult room for comedians because they were there to see music. Ray Romano always killed in the Wah, always. Wow. Um, I thought he was fantastic at the special, and he, I worship Ray he, Romano from uh, Men of a Certain Age, that TV show. That was a great show. And after he did his set, we sat down next to each other, and I told him I thought it was one of the greatest shows. Uh, for re- how real it felt that I'd watched in years, you know? And yeah, it, and it's too bad would, it, when it got canceled. Oh, man, it was such a bummer, you know? Yeah. So, so he was always, he was always great. And, and, um, and the guy who was the killed harder than anybody has ever killed, who didn't become a household name, was Alan Havey. Oh, Alan Havey, I know him. Who's yeah. still performing and is still great. Absolutely. He's always at the Comedy Magic in L.A. Yeah. And he's here when he's here. He and he, I think, came on the scene like five or six years too early. You know, he had the first late night talk show on, uh, it was when there were two comedy. It was, it was Ha and the Comedy Channel. Right. And then it became Comedy Central. So he was on one of them. I don't remember which one. Uh, late Night with Alan, uh, Night by Night with Alan Havey. I don't know what it's called. And he was excellent at it, and he was extremely handsome, and he was, he, everybody thought I was going to be a leading man, and I mean, there's this famous kind of story where John Stewart came in and said to SC, do you think I'll ever be as good as him? Like, every, he was the gold standard. And, I'm, I, I, and I'd say of all of them, nobody I ever saw kill harder than Alan Havey. Wow. Yeah. Anybody you ever see that you thought, no way, and later they got great, you're like, this guy, no way. No, I think it's going to sound like, well, it shouldn't. I think that it's not, generally it's not such a surprise when somebody's successful. It's more, the bigger surprise has been the people who didn't make it bigger. Like like that Geraldo, who eventually kind of hit on these roasts. Right. But he was much, much more than a roast comic. Like this, like this guy was a... He had tremendous depth. He was handsome. He was a great actor. He could do anything. And he had, you know, pilot after pilot. We were sure he was going to be a big star. We were sure Alan Havey was going to be a big star. But the guys who hit it, like, nobody was surprised that Che hit it huge. Just nobody was surprised. Yeah. yeah. Nobody was surprised that Chappelle hit it big. Nobody was surprised that John Stewart hit it big. Uh, maybe some people were surprised that, that Ray Romano hit it big because he wasn't um, hipper, as hip. But I wasn't surprised, you know. Um, so, so no, no, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a shock. Yeah. I will tell you this. I didn't care for, now maybe I'm wrong in retrospect. I didn't care for Lisa Lampanelli when she was a regular here. I, I, and you know, and I, I have no problem with, I'm not offended by anything, but that kind of harsh racial humor rubbed me the wrong way at the time. 
Although my father really liked her. So uh, I, was I surprised? I don't know. I was surprised that she hit it so big, but she would have to be the one I was most surprised about. i tell you, um, I, I got to thank you for doing the podcast before I, I let you go. I, I think that you, what I love about you and, and you're like, your passion is like, is at 10. And that's, it reminds me of me as far as like, I just love being around this. You know what I mean? And, and when I see you at the table or you're doing the podcast or you're jamming, I relate to you on so many levels of like, that guy is living it right there. You know what I'm saying? And, and I love that about you. I, I appreciate that. Do you have trouble making friends with people your own age at this 100%. point in your life? 100%. Um, that's why I think when I did comedy, when I met Marin and Burr, they were close to my age and they were still, they were in the business. So they were so in this good stuff. They were seeing movies and plays and buying records and doing comedy and everything. So I grabbed them and, and, and it wasn't in some kind of like, Ooh, the, because at the time these guys weren't famous when I was wrote, they started to become yeah. big over the last eight and a half, nine years. But I gravitated towards them because I was like, here's a couple of adults that are still living, you know what I mean? And they're still trying to, um, find new things in life and they, and they love to go out and explore, you know? And, and I do find it hard because what happened when I started comedy at 44, I was 44. I had no friends basically because I played music all my life. And then all of a sudden my friends were home with kids and real jobs and everything. I just never saw them again. So I was blowing around Hollywood like, you know, man, I got to get, so, you know, and then I start comedy and I get this whole new family. And it saved my life, you know? And when I see guys like you, I, I'm like, ah, oh, this guy fucking get... Like, when you and I talk music or something, I'm just like, to me, that's so... That, that energizes my brain, you know? I just love that kind of shit. Or comedy, or business. I love talking business, you know? Yeah. And, it, and I love people like that, you know? And you're not bitter. And I also love that you're a gangster. You'll say <laughs> yeah, what I'm you gangster. believe, I'm saying. Oh. You'll say what you believe, which is That's like... That's going to end me. And Yeah, and you and I have had conversations about the fear of that, you know what I mean? So I also love you for that, and, and you're just a real dude, you know? And Thank I, you very much. Dude. And so when I see that, it, it excites me. And that's why I love coming here. I'm like, I know I'm going to go here, get to this table, and these guys are going to be talking some kind of stuff, and it's going to be real. It's not like, eh, I didn't get that part today, you know? It's like real shit. The other stuff is just on the outside. It's, it's the only place, the comedy is the only place you can actually... You can talk freely. Yeah, it didn't. It wasn't always that way, but I mean, it's kind of like darkness is descending on the rest of the country in terms of uh, people censoring themselves and pretending that they don't have any thoughts other than you know the what's handed down. And um, yeah, and and I'm and I'm and I really it, I, it really bothers me. And I know I should shut up. Yeah, but I'm like I was raised at the dinner table where we could say whatever we wanted, talk about whatever we wanted, make any art, as, as long as, like, in my house, as long as I could, uh, as long as I was obeying the rules of logic and, uh, and honesty and uh, was being, you know, uh, arguing in good faith, there was no position. Like, I could, I could have sat home and said, listen, you know, are we sure that the Holocaust really happened? How do we, how do we know that? And my father would we would have that conversation. He wouldn't say, you know, you should go to jail. Like, how dare you, you talk about it or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, there, was, there was no such thing as a, as a off-limits point of view. There was, all, there was just arguments that, that, didn't, uh, that, were, that couldn't be respected, that didn't, didn't play by the rules. And it's not that way anymore. No. So, like, on the podcast, I, I'm always playing devil's advocate, but I know I, I need to shut up. I just need to shut up. Well, now that you have a TV show... Huh. Yeah, you know, you gotta be extra careful. Are you? Well, that's the thing because it's now. I always say you can say anything you want until you have something they can take away. That's right. 
Well, I, I have something I could take away now, but uh, not it, 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 a, a club is harder to take away. A TV right. show, you know, especially because right. Comedy Central will, will can get nervous. Advertisers, and, you know, yeah, right, yeah. Well, well it's going to be interesting. Uh, but you know, one of these t- networks or corporations, yeah, needs to not fucking back down and see really whether there really will be any consequences. Because I suspect I believe there won't too. be. I believe that too. I believe that it's a small amount that they're buckling to, and the small amount probably doesn't even buy anything. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And they'll For forget advertisers. about it. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and the next day, there's a new thing they can scream about, and they completely forget about you. Yeah. Yeah. Can we even remember two months ago what everybody was up in arms about? No. No. Yeah. Exactly. And just, I don't even care. Like, I don't, like, I'm happy, like, Joy Reid is still on the air, even though she said all this crazy. Like, I never thought that Mel Gibson shouldn't make movies. I, I, I don't, I don't know. I, it, it, and it's not that. And I don't you're have, Jewish. Yeah, and I'm Jewish. Yeah. It's, not, it's not that I have strong, don't have strong opinions about what he said, but I'm like, just let him say whatever the hell he wants. Yeah. And, until he's, you know, hurting people or being violent or whatever it is. I, I think that the, the arguments are strengthened. All of us are forced to strengthen our arguments by forcing contact with the arguments on the other side. And when the, the arguments on the other side are censored, we will start making serious errors in our own arguments. So I kind of like the stuff always being out there in your face and, and, and pushing back. And I don't think people should be punished for it. I just don't. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a weird landscape, man. It really is because... Uh the people I think that are pushing act like they're completely clean and, and nobody's completely clean out there, you know? Like if, if, if I had, and this is happening. Everybody's I, made mistakes. If there's a comedian like was, was on Facebook like ranting about a lot of stuff that I thought was anti-Semitic stuff, I, I wouldn't, even, wouldn't even think about affecting his spots. Like it wouldn't even occur to me. But if somebody was ranting about a different race, I would be forced to stop using them. Right. You know, I would be forced to. And and because I didn't, they would say, oh, it's because you don't care about racism. And I'd be like, no, I just don't, you know, like I just, I don't want, I don't want that responsibility. Don't attack me because I'm in a position of power over somebody because you don't like what they think. He's, whatever he thinks, he has a right to say it on his own time. And I just, that can of worms, once you start down that road, you just have slicing and dicing people into smaller and smaller things it's like it's like thought crimes i I, i'm totally against it i can't thank you enough for doing the uh podcast man i i I just love it here and and thank you for everything man i'm glad you're here what a great (laughs) compound of uh you know of art you have here and uh we're in their podcast studio right now i used to live in this uh apartment yeah that's what i heard like you would stay in here and then like if you didn't want to drive home or whatever no before before i moved to the suburbs i there there used to be one big apartment and uh you know i I lived here uh with juanita before we had before we married before we had kids wow you own the whole building yeah wow this building not the underground not the underground just rent that yeah wow I love what you got going here, and I'm looking forward to going back out to Vegas. Everybody, go to Vegas. It's at the Rio. Uh, It's incredible. The shows are usually, I think it's Wednesday through Sunday. Yeah, Wednesday through Sunday. We're trying to start opening seven days soon. but Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And... um, and, and it's just a, it's an incredible room, and it'll really give you a vibe. And let me tell you something. They're using all the comics that work at the cellar. It's not just some who random dudes. This are people flown out from New York or L.A. to do the cellar, and it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's the real deal. It's, it's not a... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's smoking. And also, uh, follow the Comedy Cellar on Instagram and uh, Twitter. And come to the underground and the cellar when you come to New York, man. And thank you so much. Do you have uh, any social media yourself or no? Yeah, there you go. No. And you play here on the weekends, play some music still. Yeah, Fridays and sometimes Saturdays. It's awesome. Yeah. And uh, sometimes uh, you guys turn it up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Depends who's playing with us, yeah. I love it, man. You guys do like a great, uh, some great Prince tracks, man. I'm gonna get in there and sing with you guys one night. I would love that. It'll be love great. It. Yeah. All right, thanks for tuning in, guys, to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Keep the candles lit. See ya. <laughs>